there are impossible desires I have for this message. Um, Most New Testament scholars don't think this text belongs in the Bible. Let me give you a few examples, and uh, you need to know ahead of time I agree with them. Don Carson, who I think is one of the world's greatest and most faithful New Testament scholars, says, despite the best efforts to prove that the narrative was originally part of John's gospel, the evidence is against them, and modern English versions are right to rule it off or put it in a footnote. And you'll notice in your text, unless you have perhaps the King James, that it's got a double bracket around it or it's in the footnote. Bruce Metzger, one of the world's most authoritative scholars on the text of the New Testament until he passed. Bruce Metzger did not believe in the divine preservation of the scripture in any practical sense. He goes on to say, the disquieting possibility remains that the evidence available to us today may, in certain cases, be totally unrepresentative of the distribution of readings in the early church. Bruce Metzger, one of the world's most authoritative scholars on the text of the New Testament until he passed away in 2007 said, the evidence for the non-Johannine, that means doesn't belong in the Gospel of John, origin of this pericope, which is a fancy word for paragraph, of, of the adulteress is overwhelming. Leon Morris, who's going to be with the Lord also, but one of, one of my teachers and a, and a great, great scholar, The textual evidence makes it impossible to hold that this section is an authentic part of the gospel. Andreas Kirstenberger, who teaches, uh, oh dear, Southeastern or Southern? What? Southeastern, Southeastern, yeah. And and I love love his commentary. I I, I use it and get so much help from it. Uh, This represents, he says, overwhelming evidence that the section is non-Johannine. And one last one, Herman Ritterboss, whose commentary I also love, uh, wrote, written a couple of decades ago, the evidences point to an unstable tradition that was not originally part of an ecclesiastically accepted text. So there they are. These are the the best that you can have, in my judgment, and and they all agree, and, and I think they're right, that this text that was just read is not originally in the gospel. It got added centuries later. That's the position I think is accurate. That the way he begins here, I think, is typical for most evangelical pastors and scholars. Now, of course, John Piper is way ahead of the curve of most pastors. Um, he, again, has a Ph.D. in New Testament uh, from a German university. Uh, he reads the Bible in the original languages. Um, he, he is a scholarly pastor, so he's way ahead of the curve of where most um, uh, pastors are. But like most pastors, m- most evangelical pastors, in truth, I think what he's going to say is that really he has not given, I don't think, that much attention to the textual issues in the Pericope Adulteri. Instead, he has relied upon the expert advice of other people who have studied it. And this is uh, uh, called an appeal to authority. And uh, I, was, I, I went in uh, off my bookshelf and picked up a little book that my wife used with um, our children when she was doing homeschooling with them, and she still is homeschooling them, but my older children, she used this book um, called uh, The Fallacy Detective. Uh, and it's written by Nathaniel Bluehorn and Hans Bluehorn, um, 36 Lessons on How to uh, Recognize Bad uh, Reasoning. And um, I pull this down and, and, and open it up to uh, a chapter. It's Lesson 9. And they discuss the, the, the logical argument of appeal to authority and how 
it can become a logical fallacy. Now, I'm not saying necessarily here that John Piper is engaging in a logical fallacy yet, um, but an appeal to authority can be a reasonable logical argument, but it can also be a fallacious logical argument. And this is just a little bit of what they, they, they say about it. This is uh, page 59 uh, that I'm reading from. Uh, they say, we are appealing to an authority when we claim something is true because an authority said it was true. Appealing to the advice of an authority can be good when we do it in the right way. However, if the person we are appealing to is not actually an authority in the area we are discussing, our appeal is faulty. So that's one way an appeal to authority can be false. If we appeal to someone and they're not really an authority in that particular area, it's a faulty appeal. They go on to say, unfortunately, some people use an appeal to authority in the wrong way. They appeal to an authority when arguing with people just to overawe them. And so it's also a wrong use of appeal to authority if you do so simply to overawe or overwhelm uh, your audience or the person you're trying to convince. Um, and then finally, this is over on page 60, uh, they say, when the topic under discussion is controversial among respected authorities, then appealing simply to the opinion of a single authority is a faulty appeal to authority. If many accepted authorities disagree on a particular subject, we can't say our favorite authority is the correct one. There may be many other equally respected authorities who disagree. Now, Piper is not going to appeal to just one authority. He's going to list several people who do not believe that the Pericope Adulterite is part of the original text of Scripture. He's going to appeal to multiple ones. What he doesn't do, though, is he doesn't point out that um, there are people with reputable credentials who would argue in favor of the Pericope Adultera as being part of the original text of Scripture. Um, there's Maurice Robinson, who teaches at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, there is David Punch, who appeared at the uh, Pericope Adultera uh, conference. There are people like Zane Hodges, Arthur Farstad, Wilbur Pickering, uh, people who understand text criticism, uh, Edward Hills, um, and uh, they believe, Theodore Letus, they believe that the Pericope Adulteri was a legitimate original part of the text of John. And so, um, anyways, we have to be careful with appeals to authority. And once again, I think most people hold the views that they do, um, most pastors, based on the authorities that they read when they were in seminary, and then I think most people in the pews often hold the the views that they do on the text of Scripture because of the authority of their pastor, um, elders in their church who have taught them uh, this perspective. They assume it's true because people they respect hold this opinion. So.